Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore. In Iraq, ISIS is advancing towards the Haditha Dam, one of the most significant sources of hydroelectricity in the country. Meanwhile, the U.S. and U.N. have thus far been unsuccessful in their attempts to encourage Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki to bring the Sunnis and Kurds into the coalition government. The United Nations also reported that at least 1,000 people have died in Iraq so far this month, saying that this number, quote, should be viewed very much as a minimum. Syria also took its first major action in Iraq, conducting two airstrikes over the last couple days in the Anbar province, according to Iraqi officials. U.S. officials also told the New York Times that Iran has sent drones into the country and is continuing daily shipments of military equipment to assist the Iraqi central government in its fight against ISIS. The news comes as about half of the expected 300 U.S. military advisors have now arrived in Baghdad. Joining us now to give an analysis of the situation is Sabah al-Nasri. He was born in Basra in Iraq, and he teaches Middle East politics and economy at the Political Science Department at York University in Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Sabah. Good to be with you, Anton. So we've heard appeals from U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, the Shiite Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani, and the U.N. Um, for al-Maliki to incorporate Kurdish and Sunni politicians into the coalition government, though al-Maliki seems to have rejected this altogether. And it seems that there is a division emerging between Shiite political leaders. Uh, for example, the New York Times reported that Muqtada al-Sadr has revived the Mahdi army, which played a major role in the sectarian civil war from 2006 to 2008. And he has also said that his militia, uh, he's not willing to have his militia come under the control of the al-Maliki government. So what do you think is uh, the future for al-Maliki? It's an excellent question. And let me just go one step back to answer this question. You see, the constitution and the election, election law uh, inherently force different political forces to appeal to their own community to be elected. So the whole Iraqi polity was fractured along ethnic and sectarian lines. So the biggest problem of al-Maliki, it's not the Sunnis or the Kurds, it's the Shiites for two reasons. One is the nominally Shiite majority cannot be translated into political majority. And second, there are strong cont contenders within the Shiite communities, like al-Hakim al-Sadr, with whom al-Maliki actually uh, contest over political power. So the major problem of al-Maliki is, is the Shiite community and the, Shi and the Shiite contenders. So if we go back to December 2013, where we had the peaceful protesters in Ramadi, in Fallujah, etc. Al Maliki gambled and escalated the conflict militarily to win the election. And he actually opened the gates, not only the door, but ISIL to occupy a lot of cities at that time and until today. But he won the election. The problem is his platform was organized around law and order, and he intended to win an absolute majority so he can rule absolutely. He failed because not only the Sunnis and the Kurds, they don't trust al-Maliki, but even the Shiite communities or the other Shiite political forces. So it might sound paradox that the fate of al-Maliki depends not on the Sunni and the Kurds and their progress or opposition to him. It depends on the Shiite political forces because they are the only one who can nominate al-Maliki for the term if they agree. Uh, on al-Maliki as a minister president. So his main problem are the Shiite contenders and struggle of a political power within the community. So the conflict is intra rather than inter-community. So let's talk about the, uh, the Iranian role right now in the situation. Um, you know, they, as I said, they've been sending lots of military equipment uh, to support al-Maliki. Uh, do you think that that if if that's um, if if there if uh, if Al Maliki is not able to use that in order to prop up uh, and maintain his power, do you think that um, that Iran will send in troops if there appears there appears to be a critical moment when Al Maliki right. might fall? Three things. I don't think first of all that Iran will send troops because Iran knows if, if it sends troops to Iraq, the majority of the Iraqi population will consider this an occupation, and then they will escalate the conflict. So not only the, the so-called Sunni, of course, but even um, Biggest, biggest, you know, um, um, uh, or the majority of the Shiite community in Iraq would consider this as an occupation. So they, they will not send troops. Yes, they support al-Maliki and they bet on al-Maliki. And until now, the U.S. was actually 
uh, d'accord with al-Maliki because Iran betted on Maliki. Now there's a problem, of course. So they are trying to support them militarily with weapons and, 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 and advising and so on. But they will not send a troop there. Because Iran considered ISIL as a threat to it. And Iran knows that behind ISIL, many regional political forces supporting it. So it considered as a, as a, as a threat to its um, uh, security. And the second thing is, Iran doesn't want the U.S. to intervene in Iraq militarily. They don't want the U.S. troops in Iraq. Because up until today, especially after the withdrawal of the U.S. troops from Iraq, Iran has an enormous influence in Iraq politics qua al-Maliki. So they want to help al-Maliki to contain the problem in order um, uh, to um, make, make the, 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 any U.S. Um, attention of sending troops to Iraq uh, impossible. And so if, uh, and in terms of the, the Syrian airstrikes, I mean, it, it seems uh, unclear thus far whether they, they are confirmed or unconfirmed, but if, if the reports turn out to be true that Syria in, indeed has uh, um, engaged in targeted airstrikes against ISIS, uh, why do you think that um, they decided that the Assad-led government has decided now to intervene, and uh, what role do you see as Syria? Uh, do you see Syria having um, as the conflict continues? Right. You see, up until recently, the 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 the, the conflict in Syria was concentrated on the western and northwestern part of Syria. So that's why the Syrian army was engaged with different um, um, oppositional forces coming from Turkey, or Lebanon, and so on. So the whole focus was on the western and northwestern ter territories, not the east. And that's where ISIL actually occupied, especially the border cities between Iraq and Syria and so on. They occupied these spaces and operate from them. So the, 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 the Syrian army, until recently, they did not see any threat on the eastern part to the, to the role of uh, the ISIL government in Syria. Now, of course, things have shifted. For two reasons, because Iraq and Iran are, so, you know, supporters of, of, of al-Assad in Syria against all these uh, different contradictory and conflictual political forces of the opposition. And the second thing is because ISIL now occupied actually uh, border cities between Syria and Iraq and between Jordan and Iraq and Travil too. So what they did now after the occupation of Mosul and other cities of Iraq, as, as I said in the last interview, they they start transporting all the modern weapon, U.S. weapons, by the way, from Iraq to Syria to to strengthen you know their position in Syria and to start an, a new offensive against the Assad, the Assad government. So that's why I think the Assad government now and the Syrian army taking ISIL much more seriously than it, it, it did before. Let's talk about the role of the U.S. military advisors uh, that are being sent to Baghdad. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry was quoted by. The Guardian um, is explaining the purpose. Uh, he said, quote, we are not here in a combat role. We are not here to fight. And the president has no intention, none whatsoever, of returning American combat troops in Iraq to go back to where we were. Do you think that this is um, exemplary of like, the US being committed to uh, maintaining al-Maliki's position? Or is this about protecting the power of, this, of the state? I think the US uh, doesn't insist on al-Maliki anymore. They did in the last, as I said, eight years when al-Maliki was nominated literally by the U.S. ambassadors in Baghdad. I don't think that they, they bet on al-Maliki anymore because he failed to uh, to keep his promises. He gave a lot of promises in the last few years, especially before the withdrawal of the U.S. troops uh, from Iraq in uh, at the end of 2011, that there will be an opening of the political process, the inclusion of the Iraqi communities, and the representation for all minorities in Iraq. He failed to do that. And I, as I said, it's not a personal issue. It's not only in Maliki. Everybody else on, on, in, in his place would have done the same because the whole structure of the state, as I said, inherently pushed these political forces to appeal only to their community because they considered the only you know, social basis that could bring them to power. So the, the, the structure inherently frac fracture the, pol the, the, the polity, the Iraqi polities, and reproduces all these kind of sectarian ethno um, ethno conflict. I think this uh, the United States realized recently that the only way to go forward is to probably um, to bet on a different candidate, much more inclusive, and to convince different political forces in Iraq, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the, and the Shiite political parties 
to nominate a different candidate um, in the state of Al Maliki. It could be someone from Al Dao Party because they won the election with 92 seats, or his uh, platform, the, the rule of law, or the state of law, but not Al Maliki. So I think uh, what the 300 advisors, what the issue of the advisors, um, what makes it important, two issues. One, uh, the U.S. secured something they were not able to secure three years ago, namely an immunity uh, against prosecutions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iraqi law. So these 300 advisors, they will not be um, uh, subjugated to Iraqi law. I think that's a major concession and Maliki had to make to the U.S. to have any kind of help he wished for. The second thing, I think it's much more political rather than military. Because what happens, as we, as we discussed in the last interview, uh, a total collapse of the security apparatus. And Al-Maliki personally is in charge for that because he is the one who concentrated all the security institution in, in his hands. So the collapse of this apparatus is his own mistakes. So what, what was obvious is that despite some you know modern weaponry and some training by the US training and so on, the whole structure of the security apparatus, the, the chain of commands, the um, the, the the, the responsibilities and so on were not clear. There was institutionalized confusion. So I think probably the role of these advisors will be much more political in the sense in producing a new form of, of, of military leadership and, and chain of commands, which is much more inclusive and a bit outside the prerogative of al -Maliki. If they are capable of doing this, they might be able to, you know, to restructure or help restructure the, um, the Iraqi army, not according to ethnic or sectarian lines anymore. I think they need to, to reevaluate and question all their assumptions about Iraq since 2003, if they want, if they want to go forward. Okay. And U.S. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry also recently met with the president of the Northern Kurdish region in Iraq, uh, President uh, Massoud Barzani. And he was basically urging him not to uh, urging him not to break away from from the central government in Baghdad to sep uh, to separate from Iraq. Uh, why is the U.S. concerned with this possibility of the Kurds forming their own state? Well, I don't think they're concerned uh, that the Kurds will make their own state for a simple reason, because the Kurds they are not a homogeneous entity. They're, you see, there are different political forces in Kurdistan, and there's a major conflict between the Patriotic Union in Kurdistan, which is you know partly an ally of al-Maliki and the Democratic Party of Kurdistan of Barzani. But there's also a third political force, um, which is change. The third actually became the second uh, uh, party during the last election in Kurdistan, stronger than the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. So you have many political forces in Kurdistan. And sometimes some political forces in Kurdistan utilize the issue of, 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 of separation and, and create the, and the creation of independent Kurdish state to push the central government uh, to make more concession. And I think in, in, the, la in the last few months and, and, and the, actually the last two years, they were right in doing so because al-Maliki, as I said, he did not keep his promise. He did not stick to the uh, Erbil agreement to which the Kurds and the Sunni and so on, Shia political forces agreed. So the Kurds are not satisfied with him, and the Sunni are not satisfied with him, and other Shia parties are not satisfied with him. So what Barzani did in the last few months, actually he invited all these political forces to Erbil to discuss with them. Uh, um, you know, the two years ago, they tried to introduce a, 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 a vote of, of, um, um, against al-Maliki within the parliament. Uh, mistrust against al-Maliki didn't work. So they, they Invoke, uh, they invited all these political forces to precisely to push for a different uh, uh, development with a different candidate. So I think the Kurds are utilizing the separatist independent um, issue to push the U.S. seriously to not to gamble anymore on Maliki and to look for different candidates. And there are the candidates uh, with whom the Kurds and the Sunni um, are in agreement. So the Washington Post also reported that John Kerry is heading to Paris on Thursday to meet with officials from some Gulf states, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and also from Jordan, in order to um, to, to force him to push uh, Sunni groups in order to uh, break with ISIS and uh, preserve uh, a unified state of Iraq. Do you think uh, that it's in the interests of, of these various nation states to do so? 
Well, yeah, I mean, the, in the last few days, uh, the, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so on accused al Maliki of being sectarian, excluding the Arab Sunnis from Iraq and so on. And they are uh, like um, the United Arab Emirates, they withdraw their ambassadors from Baghdad, etc. So there was a, a huge setback for al Maliki in, in this regard. And, and I think that we should, we should be clear here. It's not like... Um, Sunni political forces and tribal forces in the western, northwestern provinces of Iraq are siding with ISIL. No, they are they are not siding with ISIL. They are not resisting ISIL. Uh, they they don't see a threat in ISIL as much as they see it in Al Maliki and his uh, in his militias. So I believe once they feel there's a new political process, much more um, um, inclusive, and there's a real representation of these communities. They will fight back against ISIL and kick them out from their from their territories. But they don't see the necessity of doing this now because they think that the, the central government of Iraq represents much more threat to their political, economic, and social um, uh, power than the uh, ISIL. So we shouldn't assume that these forces, who enabled in a way by not resisting ISIL, are supporting ISIL or allies of ISIL. I think this is um, incorrect. That's what Al Maliki trying to suggest, and partly the U.S., but it's not true. Okay, Sabah al Nasri, Professor of Political Science at York University. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.